Hi everyone and welcome back to the 21 and Century podcast with me, Emily. And on today's episode we have another special guest. I have a lovely lady called Jane Green on. So Jane is autistic and she is a single parent of two, um, one child who has severe medical issues and the other one who is autistic. So she's volunteered with all ages to sort of gain experience um, and study for her degrees. Jane has worked in all different sort of phases of education, um, including like epilepsy and autism schools. Unfortunately, um, her illness kind of worsened and she had to retire um, in 2015 but um, following this she received a diagnosis of Ellis Down syndrome which is EDS um, and since then she's kind of started volunteering for the national EDS charity and has also founded SEDS which is Sussex, Ellis Danos and Hypermobility Support in 2018. Outside of the group Jane also volunteers her skills as a carer trustee for a local carers charity and she's also an expert patient for various other committees so things like patient ref groups, clinical commissioning groups, NICE advisory committees and social care roundtables. She's also sat on various guidance on autism from child to adult transitions and has overseen new co-production autistic-led social care toolkits. Jane has been diagnosed as autistic in 2016, aged 54. So I think we're going to have a really sort of interesting chat about autism in women and like late diagnosis as well. Um, But yeah, Jane, do you want to say hello? Yes. um, Thank you so much for introducing me. Um, I am, (laughs) I say I'm a late diagnosed person. Some people say elder late diagnosed. Some people say wiser. I'm not sure any of those are appropriate really. (laughs) Um, But it does make me slightly, you know, when younger people say I'm late diagnosed, I think, well, what am I? I must be truly ancient. So let's discuss your diagnosis that you have. So you are diagnosed with autism and something called hypermobility Ellis Danos syndrome. Um, are you able to kind of explain when you got those diagnoses and a little bit more about them? Yes. So um, as you say, I wasn't diagnosed autistic until 2016. But mm-hmm. before that, I was actually um, a professional autism educationalist and um, but never believed and um, that was quite challenging also all during my life I had various symptoms and Mm -hmm. now I know conditions and I know what they are but I didn't know at the time I thought they were completely normal and um, they were things like bloating tummy aches um maybe some bowel issues and allergies, um, infections. I used to get loads of infections. And and then the injuries like dislocations and sprains and all sorts. Um, And it got to the point where I was so ill and my injuries had just increased that um, I got a diagnosis in 2015, the year before, the autism one, of Mm -hmm. Ehlers-Danlos syndromes. And yes, I didn't really know what they were. Um, I knew I was bendy because all the doctors had labelled me on their paperwork, bendy lady, (laughs) 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 which is, okay, I'm bendy. And they all go, oh, ah, look at this. And they're always touching my skin in a nice way because it feels different. Um, Or looking at my the flexibility of my joints. Um, Mm. But yeah, I didn't know what it meant. And I actually had to buy a book um, on Erlis Danlos because it's Mm. a strange name. I couldn't even pronounce it. And I probably still, I have a real problem with pronouncing words occasionally. And I had to give it to my doctor because they didn't really know about it. Um, They're not trained in it. Mm-hmm. And so I bought it for my doctor and I actually wasn't working then. I had no, no, I was on sick leave and then medically retired. So I had to give it to my doctor and they're not cheap. Mm-hmm. Um, and it explained a lot in a way and I'm still learning. So it's only been, where are we, four or five years now. Mm-hmm. I've had to learn about it, but two years of that were 
were were a bit stuck for me when I became very very ill mm-hmm. so I couldn't do too much then and um, it's a multi-systemic um, complex tissues disorder so that's quite a lot to take in but basically yeah. it affects it can affect every part of your body mm-hmm. and and body brain actually so um, it can give you migraines headaches uh ear problems, eye problems, teeth problems, um, swallowing issues, reflux, you know, I could go on and on and on. Mm -hmm. It it affects the skin, some people much more than others. It can Mm -hmm. affect the vascular system for some people. Um, Mainly it's the hypermobility of the or the laxity of the dis, the joints and the ligaments okay. and the connective tissue which okay. holds us all together and right. we have a, a deficiency in the connective tissue basically it's a bit floppy okay. and 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 if you think about it if you have weak um, you know collagen people have heard of collagen mm-hmm. which is part of the connective tissue if you have weak sort of strength what I say is if you're building a house with cement actually this wasn't my original quote no one knows who actually did the quote so I can say it Um, but I added to it which I do Uh if you're building a house with cement and sand and water you have to get it in the right proportions Mm -hmm. and um, and and then you make a good strong house with bricks but if you use some part of the house in a different proportion, more sand or more water than you should be, you'll get a really, really wonky house. And then you have to think about, you know, you're putting in furniture and the different temperature differences in the year, Mm -hmm. what happens to the house. And then you've got to think about the electrics and waterworks, what happens then. And it's like, boom, (laughs) sort of thing, (laughs) which is what happened to me. Yeah. That's that's so much to to deal with, and just the fact that you got that kind of diagnosis quite late in life, as well as the autism diagnosis, that must have been quite a lot to like process. You're you're spot on, actually. Yeah. Um, and I thought I knew how to deal with this. Um, mm. Not not so much the Ellis Danlos, because I think. After my diagnosis, I believed that I would be taken care of finally. You know, people would believe me and there'd be a pathway. And you get your diagnosis and then you're discharged. Yeah. And you'll go back to primary care who do not know about it, sadly. I mean, very willing, great, great GP, but didn't know about it. Mm-hmm. And, and and that's why I do what I do. But. Yeah, it, it's it's quite um, unnerving to think I was. Te- I didn't even do social media in 2016 um, yeah. because I'd been so busy and I'm older. I hadn't really. I had a Facebook account and I think I had. I think one of my children set me up with Twitter years ago, okay. but I didn't actually use it until like 2017 mm-hmm. um, and. So I was all new to this, so I didn't have those links either. And I was so busy being ill and working, yeah. I just hadn't had time to work it out. Mm-hmm. And um, and then getting um, the autism diagnosis, which I knew I was, but I knew I wouldn't get in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was happy to get it, I think, but I didn't believe it. Okay. <laughs> I actually thought – because I've had so many years um, of this, it, it was a strange, discombobulating way. I say I've been in for a couple of years, not mm-hmm. believing I've been in any group or anything. I still, okay. I'm not really, and um, so it's a strange place to be mm-hmm. because I was actually leading in autism training and education, and was told I couldn't be autistic, so I didn't know what I was. Okay. Gosh, that's that's so difficult to be to be told that and to just kind of like you say kind of go along with it and not uh, do you almost feel like you're not like autistic enough to be autistic? That's, that, like Oh yes, absolutely. I I thought 
In fact, for the diagnosis, I, I said to them, look, this is what I, I've done, I do, I know what to say. Um, mm. I, could, I could lie myself through the assessment because I know what mm-hmm. to say, but I don't want to do that. And I don't yeah. want to do the forms because <laughs> I know what to put <laughs> down. And, and they, they actually said to me, well, that's what we'd expect you to say. And I went, oh, okay, that's interesting. I'll, mm. I'll carry on then. And, mm. um, and, and yes, I, I had the assessment and given the diagnosis. And then I thought, yeah, but they don't really know what they're doing, <laughs> which was <laughs> awful. I take that back totally. But I thought, yeah, you know, that imposter thing, I'm not really, I can't be because I know what to say. Yeah. At the same time, I knew it. So, and I just, I didn't, mention it out loud I didn't say anything in fact I had a I didn't do anything about it at all I just had to uh, simulate it which is what I do for mm-hmm. a while a couple of years really and and then I realized that um, things had to change particularly mm-hmm. for professional people older people and and not being believed especially um, in my area um women were not believed to be autistic at all. Mm -hmm. And certainly no one had heard of Ella Stanlos either or any, any sort of association or co-occurring condition with autism. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I just sort of went public then. That must've been very scary to like, like you say, you're, you're, you were already like a professional in that field and to then kind of have people saying that, Oh, you you can't be autistic if you're, (laughs) you know, you're like, doing this kind of thing but to actually like it's very it's a very brave thing to like go kind of public with it as you say and to share and be quite open and honest about about it was that quite scary it it is scary because um it's not something you do and a lot of people you know I had actually not been believed particularly in various areas uh for good reason you know because they maybe hadn't seen it before so I found that quite challenging um and and just knowing that I was and I wasn't I I sort of link it to I don't know because you're lovely and young but um (laughs) I saw the first Blade Runner film in the 70s I don't know you might have seen the second one you Mm -hmm. might not be into science fiction which is absolutely fine I quite (laughs) like it (laughs) Um, I've seen Blade Runner (laughs) so um but there's a replicant there who tries to pretend they're um, human. And that's how I felt all my life. Um, mm. And I wouldn't say, so. Pers- this is totally personally opinion. I, I don't mask. I am who I am. I just adapt. And um, I think we all adapt to situations. Uh, as I said in my training very often, um, if I'm on a desert island, who would would I still be autistic? You know, I'm I'm adapting to the environment there, and that's what mm-hmm. I do. Um, but yeah, the social environment is slightly different, I suppose. And mm-hmm. I think, I think if I if I'd had um, awareness from people, uh, especially with my physical health and and autism, I would have had. Um, adjustments made for my work, for example, mm. and therefore, under the Equality Act, you can um, get uh, protected characteristics and you get support. All those sort of things, like oh gosh, so many people have like uh, I hear about, which would have been amazing, but mm. I didn't have that, and and therefore, I'm particularly bad at political stuff, <laughs> which goes on um, because I'm little and I. You know, if someone says, I believe in this, then I think they believe in that. Or yeah. if they say they're going to do this in a meeting, then I believe they are going to do that in a meeting. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, you know, I just, I, I am not very able to work that social um, whole discourse out, really. Yeah. Um, and and that, that was a deficit for me in keeping my job. No, no question about it. Each time, so I lost my job quite a lot. Um, but I, I did have some very significant jobs, which I was really, really proud of, considering my background. Really, mm. yeah, no, that's that's amazing, and uh, it's it's so 
it's difficult when it comes to like the workplace and telling employers and like do you tell your colleagues and like that's something that I also Mm. can really relate to because it's quite a personal thing and it's quite a like I don't know it's a big thing to like adjust to having a diagnosis like just for yourself so to you know be brave enough to tell other people and hope that their opinion doesn't change on you and all these different things Mm. and also you know being autistic and being a female which a lot of people don't are still not quite coming around to the idea of it's it's all very scary (laughs) yes I I think fear is is key obviously and that leads to anxiety I think um telling colleagues is incredibly difficult particularly in my area because I was working in this area so um and it's not what we did we we focused on um, boys. Well, I was in education, so it was boys mainly. It's mm-hmm. interesting you say about employment, though. I've just done some, because I've done quite a bit of work training organisations to help autistic people mm-hmm. apply for jobs. But I'm very, very keen. I, I, about a couple of years ago, I did, um, I think, an autism show or something um, about employment and, mm-hmm. and how it should be. Um, top down uh 360 degree it's no good just doing the autistic person applying for a job and making it easier for them if the culture doesn't change from the top so i i sit on boards quite big ones and little (laughs) ones and um i'm very keen that the um you know there should be representation diversity everywhere because you won't get culture change if it's not. And and even down to the management level, because um, you just need one person to scupper it or have the authority to say this person's no good or, yeah. or we're not putting the adjustments in. And then, you know, it could ruin the day or the life of that autistic person. So, mm-hmm. is it, and, and seeing the strengths, you know, of having autistic people everywhere, not, yeah. you know, on the board is, mm-hmm. is for me really empowering and Mm. we have so many strengths obviously um to offer in different ways in different ways i'm not talking Mm. about learning disabilities here particularly um but even so all different ways uh we can add so much and we do to we're just not known about um so that's that's what I'm, i'm trying to do is to empower people, particularly women, particularly working professional women, who I've been told um, in one of my groups, they'd rather leave a job than disclose their diagnosis because they can't get reasonable adjustments. Yeah. Yeah. That seems easier sometimes. Like to me, I've thought about that, which is madness to think that leaving a job is easier than disclosing a difficulty or yes, you know, a diagnosis. Absolutely. And if you add in ehlers danlos syndromes, which we seem to be quite prone to there seems to be a sort of there isn't an association but it's definitely getting there we've got a relative risk of it um and that's not believed as well um because people don't know about it or it's very hard to get a diagnosis anyway then you're it's like a double jeopardy and i feel you know Oh dear, <laughs> we're we're doubly um, affected in that way, so we yeah. we don't get believed, and that can lead to trauma. Mm. And if you think about it, all through, I think even when I was young, you know, it, it wasn't known about. I thought everybody had this pain all the mm. time, from gosh, you know, menstruation pain. It's meant to be painful, okay? It's meant to be mm. painful. I didn't realise yeah. what pa- I don't realize what pain is because my interoception sense is a bit um dodgy and Mm. um and that that affects all my senses and um which I know now because I've had training and um and also I think when you're in pain a lot you lose your sense of pain and that Mm. has been something that's gone throughout my life so people don't believe me even in hospitals occasionally and I've got a really serious injury, but they don't believe it because I'm not sh- d- in enough distress, acute distress or pain, acute pain, because mm-hmm. I'm used to it. So I would, you know, that tick box one to 10 thing. Yeah. I will probably put a five or six for dislocation. Mm. Whereas other people would be off the wall. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's a very like like autistic thing as well is being kind of over or underreactive to yeah. pain. And I've heard so many people say about that like one to ten scale and actually, you know, they could be in a lot of distress and be a four or a five, like you said. And actually, you know, a doctor not realise how, you know, the severity of the pain because of how the person, like the patient's processing it. So it's interesting you've said that as well. Yes, definitely. I think I've written about this a bit, um, the interoception sense and how we we can't relate it to emotional um, anxiety, for example, and fear. You know, we don't mm-hmm. realise that when we're not, when we're shallow breathing and our muscles are really, really tense, it might mean that we're fearful of something but not realise it. I'm terrible yeah. with anxiety. I don't get anxious, but then I do. I don't mm-hmm. see anxiety as part of my makeup at all, but I get very anxious if I'm not doing something. <laughs> so that is anxiety. <laughs> yeah. I just don't realise it. I use a different word for it. I use mm-hmm. hyperfocus. Um, yeah. It's, uh, but we all have our different words, and I, I have to be reflective of that and and understand that people use different words for different things. I I um and it I I was reading about you and your hyperfocus, and you're amazing too, and I I find that really interesting because I think that's what drives us on mm. is our passions and how they develop mm. is really interesting. Mm. And the fact that I can, and I imagine you can as well, like lose yourself in like something you're passionate about, like your work or something, like it almost doesn't feel like work because it's something you're passionate and like interested in. So I definitely, yeah, I get that. <laughs> yes. And that has to be regulated. Um, and mm. I keep trying to tell myself, I don't actually work, as I said, because I'm medically retired, but mm. I do try and empower people doing what I do um, mm-hmm. and you can get carried away and you think oh gosh it's 3 30 in the morning <laughs> <laughs> you just lose sense of time don't you a bit mm. I get that <laughs> and don't send emails out at that time <laughs> yeah <laughs> people might wonder what you're doing after. I know. <laughs> um I was going to ask you if you don't mind um if you had your autism um like assessment on the NHS or did you go privately? I always like to kind of mm. see how people went about it. Yes, I know I am um, I'm annoyingly I find myself <laughs> annoyingly I want to stick to the rules and I want to I want to empower everybody to have the same opportunities if at all possible. Mm-hmm. So I went uh, via the GP, my nice GP, and asked for a referral to the NHS assessment. Um, mm-hmm. That's the way I wanted to do it. And I do generally want to do that. It doesn't always, it's not always possible, particularly with Ellis Danlos, for example. And yeah. I was, um, yes, I did get questioned why. And she said, do you already work in this area? Why, do, you know, why do you want one? I said, well, yeah. I want basically I want closure, um, mm-hmm. and I just spent a year on a bed, a sofa bed, not moving because I was so ill and injured. Mm-hmm. I mean, literally, I was seeing four walls day after day, and a lot on a lot of drugs. I was very, very ill, um, but I did stabilise, which was good, because mm-hmm. at one point I really wasn't stable. I mean, I was really fearful for my life. I've got to say, so okay. it was really scary time and yeah. um, I, I was we get something called it, it's sort of related to allergies but you can't test it um, mm-hmm. it's to do with our mast cells and I just wasn't able to keep food going at all um, okay. I kept vomiting and things like that and I couldn't breathe and just getting coughing a lot and mm-hmm. um, yeah you, you're sent for a test say uh, to check x-ray on your lungs and nothing will show up like cancer for example which is really good but mm. that's what I say all the tests come back negative so yeah. then people think it's in your head um, mm. because all the tests are negative and they weren't they were and you know my my family asked if I was dying because I was getting so ill and I I just couldn't do anything but hot water okay um 
So I've forgotten your question. <laughs> Sorry. No, I think I, um, what was it? Oh yeah, about um, whether you went private or through the NHS. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I went NHS and um, I said I didn't want to go in my area because they know me and I didn't yeah. want that. I didn't want to influence people. As I said, mm-hmm. I'm very, we are, you know, quite honest and literal and things. And I didn't want to, them to be influenced by me. Mm-hmm. So I went out of county um, and I was seen amazingly quickly, not because okay. they knew me. They had, I think they had a cancellation. So I was very, very lucky because I know the, okay. in fact, I've just helped with the adult autism diagnostic pathway oversight. Mm-hmm. Um, so I know, sadly, um, the wait times in this area. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, I'm, it's really nice to hear that. Like, cause I hear, like you say, like a lot of people having to wait like months and stuff and I did too, but that's great. Like they were able to see you so quickly. <laughs> it was. Um, and I don't like saying it because everyone's waiting like two or three years. Yeah. So I, I'm really, I, I was surprised, but it was a cancellation and yeah. I managed to fit in. Mm-hmm. Um, having said that, it was really great to get it, but I walked away with nothing, no support. Mm-hmm. So um, it, 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 it just left me, as I said, discombobulated again, because um, I looked around for autistic groups. And they were all either parent groups, which was fine. I would have loved that when I was bringing up my children. There was nothing. Or they were, and again, it's fine, but it's not for me, very active party political younger groups, which (laughs) is not me. And I don't really fit in there. There didn't seem to be anything for me at all. Um, and so, and that's that's carried on. Actually, there still isn't anything, which is um, why I set up another group. Um, but hopefully, um, people get more more brave and join. And we've got some people, but then they're, they're not out. As I said, I I went public. <laughs> I, uh-huh. I announced it straight to the paper. <laughs> I didn't even tell oh, my wow. family. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's one like surefire way of getting it out there though. <laughs> well, I don't know. Um, I haven't even, I mean, I, I do appear on the news, you know, those news bulletins you get in the, your local region sometimes. Mm. And I forget to tell my mother, for example, I'm appearing. So she says, I was just having a cup of tea and suddenly you were there. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, oh yes, I forgot to tell you. <laughs> how to how to worry your relatives just pop up on, on well, TV. She said, I, I saw your cat. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, that's brilliant. Oh, that's really that's it's really interesting to hear like uh, that you are so public about it and that like you've mentioned that you're you know, you're doing so many different roles as like I read the email, um, that was sent to me all about you and you being like a advisor on autism and EDS and hypermobility and like the chair of Sussex EDS. Yes. Um, so exciting. <laughs> yeah. You're on so many different, like you said, like big and small boards and stuff. Like how did you, did you sort of get involved in these after your diagnosis? Uh, no. So um, it, it does build up. So just to put this in context, so, I, I was a professional talking for a living, professional conferences, mm-hmm. the biggest ones they have. As a child, I was mute. I didn't talk at all. I couldn't even talk on a phone. We had like okay. landline phones then. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and and as you said in the bio, I, I, I left school early. I was considered dim. So, um, you know, it's been quite a change. And I always want to yeah. tell people and we do get younger girls, you know, things change because I think sometimes we're quite set and concrete in our views of this mm-hmm. is what it's like. Mm-hmm. And I have come to the conclusion, we don't know what it's like, but things change <laughs> <laughs> and, and embrace it. Um, so how did it be? Well, I suppose um, the key part for me, I, I started studying because I had no qualifications after my child my eldest child was diagnosed and we were excluded even from nursery school we were excluded and um 
I, I was slightly blamed, perhaps, um, you know, which was a common sort of back in the day um, mm-hmm. thought about being a mother of an autistic child. And, mm-hmm. and they also had medical issues, a lot of medical issues. So it was very full on, both of them. And um, I, I needed to know more. I knew that. So I studied psychology. And I wanted to be an educational psychologist because mm. I felt I could do add value to it than the sort of help I had received there, therein. And um, to do that, you had to be a teacher. So then you needed a degree. So I studied okay. psychology. And it was while I was studying that I really realized I, I was definitely autistic. Um, mm. And then I did a teaching degree in a totally different subject that I'd never really had ex, uh, lessons in. But I, I excelled in it because I found it fascinating how what, how people believe things. And mm-hmm. it was in religious education. And that was very interesting, particularly where I live, which um, in one of my schools, K-schools, was uh, very interesting because they have so many different religions and cults and um uh, different ways of being, so that okay. was quite interesting. And um, and then I became a special needs teacher in a epilepsy school. And during that was my qualified teacher. You get a have to do this QTS year. Okay. Um, unfortunately, the ed psych, which was just you just had a teaching degree and then you could apply, changed to the doctorate level. And that was in two thousand and six. And I went, oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't need to be a teacher after all. But anyway, I thought it would be good. And I was teaching full time. I was very ill. Um, having said this, all during these years, I had mm-hmm. multiple operations and things. And um, okay. also a single parent. And um, so I was doing this and I applied. And I think one of them really, really, really loved it. But unfortunately, oh, that was it. During my de- first degree, um, everything sort of went wrong slightly, like losing my house and um, having to work and losing my dissertation on the last thing. My computer crashed. Oh, and no. um, so I, I – and, and being a parent anyway with – a, a lot of um, effort and energy needed to go into parenting, yeah. which was great. But it took obviously my time away and I had to work part time to earn money because I didn't get benefits in those days. I didn't know how I'm useless with money. I really am. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wish I was better because I'd probably be better at it, but I'm useless with money. And um, oh, yes, yeah, so it changed to the doctorate. But I did get offered a place, which was fantastic. But unfortunately, okay. by then I was so ill, I couldn't take it. Because I knew I'd have to travel to London, and I I just didn't have the physical ability to do that. Um, Mm -hmm. I could get to the school because by then I had an automatic car, and I literally had my legs wrapped up. I didn't even get supports or splints. I sort of made them up because no one believed I needed them, and I didn't know what to get. And I'd sort of put my legs up on a chair and try and rest them. Or whatever injury I had or whatever. Uh, sometimes mm-hmm. there were skin issues going on. I get a lot of what you call skin writing, dermatographica urticaria, um, okay. which means you can write your name on your skin with your yeah. finger. It's really exciting, mm-hmm. um, but you don't feel very well. And um, and all sorts of rashes you can get, all sorts of things like crawling ants and things. And okay. so I, I had to decline it. And that was a really, really pivotal moment for me because I'd set my heart on being an educational psychologist, really mm. set my heart on it. And I had to change. And, and and from that, I learned, well, you can move on. You know, it's it's not the end. I'll change. So I did some more studying. I did um, advanced diploma in child development and then my master's in looking at autism initiatives in school. So going back to how I started being advocate, um, after Mm -hmm. that, I became an advisory teacher for the county and I lost my job after a while, a couple of years, because uh, uh, there were cuts, big time cuts, frontline all over the country. And uh, we had to go to consultation and I didn't understand the process really. (laughs) 
<laughs> which is a common thing. So I kind of was let go. And, um, but I think after that, I was snapped up, luckily, by um, Autism Education Trust and the NAS. And I became the lead there. And I started talking. And But I think what was key for me was being a teacher, the teacher training, planning, you know, to the mm-hmm. minute, to the second. It's so strict. Yeah. Really, really helped me focus. I mean, it was mega busy. I was getting up at 5 a.m. and... I would do a whole day in school plus university. It was the only university I've ever been to. And even that, you don't go full time. You're just there for a few lessons. I did the first um, send uh, lesson for my colleagues there because they didn't even get special educational needs. This is uh, training. They, oh, wow. they didn't even get it in those days. So I did the first one in that cohort. Oh, wow. So I was quite proud of that. And yeah. I thought, well, I can take the initiative. You know, I, I took the initiative getting a psychology degree because mm. I didn't have any money. They let me, I talked them into it. And um, <laughs> the same with the teaching degree because I didn't have any knowledge in it, but I was really interested in it. And I think it showed, and I had to write a quick dissertation of 10,000 words on it, which was quite interesting. Um, And I think, um, I think that that sort of passion, if you want to do something, which I, I think comes with a lot of autistic people, the the drive and the hyper focus comes through. So Mm -hmm. I would get up early, I'd do the, a day's work in school, and then you'd come back and I look after the children and and so on and so forth. And then when they've gone to bed, I would do all the planning, which you have to do for yeah. in advance. And and it's quite challenging during yeah. this time. Um, PGCE, yeah, it's meant to be challenging. And uh, but I I think that really really helped me focus on planning and being exact before because I was a bit woolly before <laughs> um, in my planning I'd plan it in my head but not actually action it and it's all about action for me you have to carry mm-hmm. things through anyone can say anything but unless you carry it through it, it doesn't matter and uh, uh, and that stayed with me so I got used to talking mm-hmm. and during my graduate degree, um, I couldn't even afford the graduation ceremony. I wasn't going to go. And I told them, sorry, I can't go. I have these issues. I wasn't asking for help. I just said, I can't go. And they said, mm-hmm. well, let us help you. And they did, luckily. And mm-hmm. and they said, would you speak for us at a conference? So this was my first speaking conference, Carers. Oh, wow. And th- I also won two awards with them, uh, which were my first ones for various couple of things which are mm-hmm. in my history and um and that was amazing because it was regional as well and I thought gosh they must have seen something that I I'm, I'm not aware of I I didn't realize it was so unusual mm-hmm. um and I hadn't even really declared I was in so, ma- so many issues but they liked the thought that I'd carried on while being homeless and no computer and sort of yeah. thing. And wow. um, so doing the carers conference, I, I realized there were a lot of people there who were carers and single parents and particularly with, you know, children with special educational needs as well. Mm-hmm. Didn't know about the bendiness. Um, I didn't really think about it. I just thought I'm just bendy with allergies. And, um, and then I got used to talking as a teacher and, I was asked to work on advisory committees for NICE and SKY, which is a social institute of education where I'm now a trustee. And okay. and that sort of evolved and I sat on co-production meetings. And by doing that, it, it's very it's very hard talking in a group, especially with mm. colleagues who are, much, mm. you know, some of them are very, very well known. But you get used to it. And your thoughts are just as valid and have value and yeah. even more so than others maybe. And and it's this way we get true authentic co-production going on, which I think is really key to hear mm-hmm. our voice. And it stops a lot of mistakes happening and wastage of money. So I got really involved in that. And from there, it's just grown. So I've always been a carer um, and I was delighted to be asked to be a carer even when I was ill. And I said I couldn't go 
anywhere and I can't do anything. But I became a carer for a local charity and I'm still there as a trustee. And I sit on, I initiated um, experience days for um, people with chronic illness and disability because at that time, I think Heathrow and Gatwick, they they didn't really see that as an issue, maybe. Um, mm-hmm. And particularly people, autistic adults and particularly autistic women. So um, it was always about children. So that's been great. And, um, you know, just that I, I had so many adults saying, oh, I didn't know if I was allowed to go because I'd always like to fly. I know it's difficult at this oh. time in COVID. Yeah. And then um, – I realized I volunteered for a national charity for EDS, which was great. And I'm still there, but I realized that locally we could do a lot more. So I was having a a coffee morning and I said, I'd like to set up a group so we can access local funds and really, really help people. And this is where I go off the NHS. I go on to private because they don't have the support we need for Mm -hmm what are issues. We need hands-on physio, we need osteo, and we need it straight away. The sooner you get to an issue, the better it is Mm -hmm. physically and mentally. And I knew this, but it was just getting people who are ill, (laughs) who might not have worked at all, to join me because it takes a lot of energy as well. Mm -hmm. And um, so it set up in 2018. I set up Sussex Ellis Danlos Hypermobility Group and it was just to be in my sort of local village and surrounding towns. Mm-hmm. It's sort of grown. <laughs> okay. Um, we're, we're across, well, West Sussex, East Sussex, Brighton and Hove, and even more surrounding areas. And we've got people from the other side of the world following us now and oh, wow. watching us. So it, it's been quite amazing. I can't meet demand. Uh, trying to desperately, yeah. but it is hard, particularly when I have to go to hospital and things um, mm-hmm. and get it ill. So I'm visiting hospital again soon. So I'm always, but I, I, I think I drive people slightly mad because I end up doing emails when I'm meant to be <laughs> on the drugs and things, okay. recovering from be recovering. operations. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I think advocating is is a really good way and I'm really keen to support new people coming up. So we're doing a parent carer forum soon and I don't know how I'll be physically actually because it will be after my operation. So I, But it's, a, it's an easy way for people to come up, uh, mothers with young children who've got early stand loss now and they know about it. And they they really, really want to do something about it. And I totally understand that. And I say, well, join me. See how you get on. Because it is, you know, quite overpowering talking to people. But mm. the more you do it, the more you get used to it. And it's just being careful what you say, that it doesn't um, – it is accurate information. You don't want to give medical information out. We're not medical. I can give educational information out. And talking of which – I've just um, led out the new education toolkit for hypermobility. So really super excited because that was my idea since I retired. I knew I've done it for autism, but I knew it could be done for hypermobility. And I Mm -hmm. even managed to lead it out one of my case schools. I did some training and they said, do you know, I didn't say anything about it. I said, we've got a lot of autistic children who have these symptoms. And I was going, yes. <laughs> <laughs> of course you do. Um, but it, we haven't got enough evidence to say that yet. Uh, we have some. I'm very lucky that I've got two patrons of my Sussex Earls Daniels group who specialize in this area. Um, one does research and she is a, I can't even remember all her titles, but she is a research fellow and psychiatrist in LS, in hypermobility and anxiety. And another one is Dr. Piers, who uh, specializes in mast cell and histamine intolerance and um, hormones, which are really, really key particularly for autistic girls and women, because we know we're more affected by hormones and therefore Ehlers-Danlos yeah. syndromes. 
Mm. Gosh, that's that's such a like a journey, number one. But number two, the amount of the sheer amount of stuff you are juggling is insane. You know, oh. your your <laughs> own health, your your, you know, your family, you're an advisor on all these different boards and you know, all this kind of education work as well that you've done in the past and the studying, like, wow, you you juggle so much and the fact that like you say, like, you know, a lot of the time you're ill or you're in hospital and, you know, doing emails in hospital and stuff like that, like it just shows how like passionate you are about it and okay, maybe you probably should be recovering if you're in hospital, but <laughs> it shows like, you know, how, you know, how interested and how keen you are to like share your knowledge, but also create a sense of community and like give back to it. So I think it's really amazing to hear all, all this different stuff you're doing. <laughs> Thank you. I think, it, you know, for me, as you know, um, doing your passion and joy, I call it joy, mm-hmm. helps you. So I, the pain medication for me didn't work. So this takes my mind off pain. Um, And I think it's reciprocity. So giving back makes you feel better too, taking Mm -hmm. action. And I love doing it. So why why would I stop? But yes, I do need to regulate myself. You're quite (laughs) right. I must stop doing it in hospital. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> driving everybody it's mad though, like when you want to try and like keep on top of things right like you want to I don't know just it, it's difficult to not like burn out and like you say like just like regulate stuff as well like I do get it <laughs> yeah I mean I have burnt out I burnt out when I got my diagnosis I didn't want to know anything about autism at all at all. I was com- so I think I was mentally burnt out then. And I've been okay. mentally burnt out when I was younger. Um, mm-hmm. After leaving in my 20s, I was burnt out. In fact, I disappeared around the world for a few years. Um, but I think, uh, and I think I was sort of, it, it sort of, I feel like I was in a fog, really. Um couldn't make sense of it and we didn't have the internet then so there was no one to tell me anything or find anything out Mm -hmm. it was just a bit foggy and now the fog's slightly cleared um Mm -hmm. I'm trying to make up time I suppose uh because I I am older and um I don't feel it (laughs) (laughs) I don't feel it um which is annoying probably and I, I feel this this just helps me with pain and energy levels. Um, but yes, it's very good to not very good, not sit down too much and keep doing your physio and whatever you have to do because yeah. I can I do have chronic fatigue syndrome, so I, I can um, just have to crash out for a while mm. sometimes. And how have you how have you found like the past year with the whole like pandemic going on in the like background how has that like affected you and obviously your health and mental health and stuff like that like have you been managing okay it's been incredibly difficult uh um unfortunately for personally for me I've been waiting on um assessments outpatient appointments some of them for five years at specialist hospitals my last assessment date was 2020 March 31st and it was the very last day they had outpatients in and I was accepted but they didn't know when I'd come back because it was turning into a COVID hospital, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. So that was that. And I've been waiting on cardiology appointments for 19 months. And I have to wear special um, insoles, orthotics and boots. And that was something I wrote about because I realized that you, you can't buy these. You have to get them from the NHS. They're made to measure. Yeah, and they were wearing out, and I was really concerned that I have to wear them because I, if I don't wear them, my f- feet tend to collapse after a while. Um, mm. And you're meant to walk, but I, they were getting really unsafe, and I realised that um, children who need orthotics would be going through this and they're growing. They're more urgent than me. Yeah. I yeah. realised that I was getting anxious about a uh, lockdown. Initially, I do sit on boards in London. So I had known in January something 
big was happening. We'd sort of been warned, um, mm. but obviously couldn't say much. And um, but I didn't, you know, you don't really realise. And um, I realised I was getting anxious, and therefore my family were getting anxious. And I realised my members would be getting anxious about this because a lot of us are autistic on the Ellis Daniels group and the other. Um, autistic group. So um, I decided to design some cards just, I suppose, for my family that if anything happened, this is what it is. This is what I am. I wanted it really personalized to me. And the the point was the charities weren't giving them out because they were all shut down. They couldn't give out their normal cards and things. And people wanted them. Mm. They were getting so anxious. So I designed some I am autistic cards and uh, then you can write down what you want or I have um, these issues, medical or whatever, or I'm an essential companion because I look after my eldest adult child and they couldn't go shopping for me. I had injured my leg as well during this time, so I couldn't move uh, much. And um, they couldn't do any shopping for me, but we weren't on the COVID list isolating and I'm very Mm -hmm. literal, so I couldn't ask for help there and we had no food because we've got alle- we've got special allergies and I realized this is a really big issue yeah. and um, so I designed those and they were put hosted by uh, Sky the Social Institute and then they feed into the Department of Health and Social Care so they were on there and um, I also have done a few things uh, trying to get support for people who rely on personal assistance. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't always advertise this, but there's a lot of work going on uh, supporting people because they were left with nothing a lot of the time. Um, And we're also carers as well. I have elderly family and a lot of people have other family issues and we couldn't Mm -hmm. get the help we needed. So, yes, it was, it was, it hasn't stopped. I would say um, it just hasn't stopped. It's the busiest time ever. Um, Mm -hmm. I was asked to feed back on so many COVID guidances and resources for the DHSC and other groups. So that's been full on trying to get, um, in all different ways, medical and educational so many, as you say, I sit on different areas, really. Yeah. And so I was feeding back on all of these. And um, we've just been trying to help our members as well um, get through it, as as other people do. In, mm-hmm. I'm sure lots of people have helped in all different ways. Um, but it's been particularly difficult if you, you're naturally anxious anyway yeah. and you don't know what's happening. And But I, I do think, and I said this to the press, I think for some people, for me, not trying to navigate London on crutches or whatever and extreme tiredness is a, is a bonus for me going to a meeting. I can do it online. Yeah. Yeah. And I think blended learning or blended um, hybrid working is the yeah. key. This is something I've been working on for ages. So, you know, COVID's awful, but maybe in this way, there's more respect for those people mm-hmm. who do have chronic illness and disability. Actually, you know, getting in there and having their voice heard, because I don't think yeah. it has been before. I think mm-hmm. in the past, when I haven't been able to make meetings and a, another person with Mobility uses a mobility scooter all the time. I do occasionally, but um, they could never make it. And we were always seen as appendages in a meeting, and they'd be talking over us and eating, say, Oh, let's see what Jane says. But they'd be chatting amongst themselves. We mm. can't do that now online. You know, you have yeah. to listen. We're not yeah. just extras there. Um, yeah. Having said that, you know, I love the social, I do like the social aspect as well but physically it, it's very tiring traveling and um, yeah. so I think that's that's one key thing that came out and I think for a lot of autistic people that demand of meeting people has actually been a bonus and they can yeah. focus on what they want to do um, so I know so many 
so many autistic people now studying psychology, for example, <laughs> or doing their masters or even further um, doctorates and so on. Uh, it must be a thing. I don't mm. know. I, I thought I was unusual, but maybe it's very, very common. I don't know, really. <laughs> yeah. No, I definitely, like, I agree, like, with what you're saying about, like, I feel like if there's anything that we can sort of go forward and have learned from the whole pandemic situation is that, you know, that hybrid or blended way of working or learning can actually really suit some people. Like, it's massively suited me not having to be mm. in an open plan office, which I talk about a lot. Oh, yes. um, so for me, it's worked so well. And I appreciate that, you know, you have to have the space at home in order to work and things like that. And I'm, you know, grateful that I have my own space to work in. But I think really going forward if we can keep these more like accessible ways of working and like you say like for you not having to you know physically travel and get to places and for a lot of other people it just it works so much better to be able to do these things online and you know to be seen as like you know as you said like a bit of a nuisance just because you know you needed yeah you know, slightly more accommodations yeah. I think that's that's madness that's how it felt uh, yeah. I, and I I'm not saying they did it on purpose it is just not not realizing not was it uh, in teaching we say yeah, do you know I've gone blank um, not not taking the path or the journey or walking in my footsteps for example if you don't do it you don't feel you don't realize how difficult it is just navigating a step down from the train and not mm. knowing if because of proprioception and the sensory yeah. issues I have I can't always tell where my feet are you have to mm. look at them um which is a shame because I used to love dancing as well. I was, you know, you just have to remind your muscles where you are. But um, yeah. you don't not always can do that sort of exercise on the train before you get yeah. off or something. It might look a bit <laughs> odd. Having said that, I've had a I had abdominal surgery in December, and um, and from that I had to use my shoulders to move myself and dislocated my left shoulder again, which kept coming out for six weeks. Oh, wow. And um, so, and now it's frozen. But I have to do these exercises where you raise your arm, your bad arm, in the air, and sort of stretch it and do the alphabet in the air. And it looks quite bizarre if I'm not <laughs> doing it because I hate wasting time. So yeah. if I'm waiting in a hospital waiting room, I will start doing it, <laughs> and I realise I really shouldn't be. <laughs> it's a good use of spare time though, I guess. Well, that's that. what I think. Use it. Yeah. I, I'm very functional with time, but I realise that oh well, does it matter? I'm too old and grumpy yeah. to care what people think now. <laughs> but I guess it does look a bit odd, really. Um I'm really, really excited though. Um I, I've been invited to be a policy lead for the first training for medical students on autism okay. health oh, wow. in the UK. And I oh. think this is so needed. Yeah, definitely. That's really great to hear. Like I get like some like random emails from like doctors and things like that. And people try and like, you can see like this stuff is, is kind of slowly becoming more of a, like, we want to teach like our medical students, you know, what to do if they do come into contact with someone who's ah. autistic and things like that. And I've, I've definitely noticed a bit more of a like uptake in those sort of like emails coming my way. And I'm like, oh, this is interesting. So it's interesting to hear that like from a professional point of view from you that yes. you're also yeah. yeah, I'm not medical as I say, but yeah, I've been invited to sit on this. And also I'm in, I'm sitting on the um mandatory training for health and social workers uh on their workforce expert reference group. I'm not working. But because I was a professional and also the strategic group. And this, well, it's going through trials now, some are completed. This will be mandatory throughout England and Wales. So Great. Um, we'll wait and see how that goes. But it's early yeah. days yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and But the, they will have to do it at some point. Mm -hmm. So, uh, But as we know, it's, it's a huge huge area and yeah. and women in particular particularly if they're articulate and seem to talk a lot um <laughs> and and do and have a you know professional career behind them if they're saying they can't cope or they're autistic i've actually not been believed recently in a medical situation even showing the okay. card um 
And uh, let's just put it this way. I had to complain very, very recently because I thought this isn't for me. This is for other people. I was, I know I wasn't believed even though I showed the card because I didn't look it. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, we've had some really good constructive conversations. I believe in action, but I have got quite a lot on and they've just asked me to sit on their steering board. They're going to set one up and they'd love me to be on board to help them. And they're very, very big trust, NHS trust. And I'm going, okay. yes, okay, let's <laughs> see who else can do this as well. Because it yeah. shouldn't all be me. Um, no, exactly. And especially if you're, you know, juggling so much already and you know, your health is you know a really big priority for you as well I know but so, it's such a good opportunity for them yeah. to learn and yeah. ideally we will get people because people in the group want to help now they want to be advocates mm -hmm. and let's hear their voices they've got just enough I'm sure they've got amazing stories as well trying to get them out there at the moment yeah. um, and that we we're not trying to be trendy to get this diagnosis of Ehlers Danlos, which mm. um, someone told me once, they're not giving them out because wow. they're too trendy. I think it's uh, because it's it's getting more awareness. If you think about it, um, 30 years ago, autism was considered rare, 35 mm. years ago. Um, mm. So Ehlers Danlos syndrome is considered rare now, but we think it's not so rare, particularly the most common type, which is my type, yeah. hypermobility, Ehlers Danlos. And um, it's just because we don't get diagnosed. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And that that's a difficulty, and that's why we have no care pathway. And that's why, you know, everything's sort of hidden a little bit for us. And we have to take the initiative and make change. Yeah. Yeah, that's so true. I think that's that's a really good point to like wrap up on as well because we have been chatting for almost an hour. Oh gosh, <laughs> over an hour actually. It's gone so quick. <laughs> no, it's, it's been really good. Like, um, I wanted to say to you, like, where can people find out more about what you're up to, and also, like, are there any like kind of website links that you want to mention so people can find out more? Yes, of course. Um, so I am on Twitter. I don't do all the um ones that you do because I'm old and dodgery and I, <laughs> I can barely I'm keep sure. up with what I do <laughs> so I'm on Twitter JG Jane Green <laughs> um, and SEDS is at S-E-D-S-H-S-D -S -S it's quite a mouthful SEDS <laughs> SEDS Heads we also have a website which is <laughs> www.sussexeds.com okay where you can find information out. There are national charities for Ehlers Danlos syndromes. There's EDS UK support mm -hmm. and there's HMSA. And they funded the um, school toolkit, which is free. It's a free resource. So you can look at that there and please do and feedback because okay. it's a living toolkit. Mm -hmm. And I've also um, helped uh, initiate the autismconnected.com, which is basically around the Sussex area. So it might not be, you know, relevant to all of you, but um, it's just yeah. to empower women or those who self-diagnose as women and non-binary, because mm -hmm. that seems to be another area that's quite big, yeah. which I'd like mm -hmm. to go more into, absolutely, mm -hmm. and probably will be quite soon. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, uh, we have Instagram and we have um, LinkedIn, and which is very key. And um, that will be all on the website because I'm really bad at remembering. That's all right. <laughs> Terrible I'll put all, at social media. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put all the links in the like kind of show notes so people can yeah, you. find them all there. Don't worry, <laughs> it's hard to remember them all. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on and being so, you know, open and chatting about your diagnosis. I really appreciate it. And I know it can be quite a like scary thing to chat to someone about it all, but um, it's really interesting to hear about all the, all the stuff you're up to and all the like great work that you've been doing. So yeah. Thank you so much. And I, I, I think I've quite enjoyed this. So um, that's always a bonus, isn't it? <laughs> thank you, Emily. <laughs>